Hello and welcome back to the second video for OCR, AS and A-level computer science. This is, these are the workbook answers. This is um, part two, software and um, software development. And there's gonna be two videos for this and this is the first video. Okay, as you can see, it's made up of five different sections for the AS and A-level computer science. We're covering this one here. Software application generation, software development, and types of programming language. Okay, here we've got 17 questions. These are gonna be ranging from four mark to one mark questions. The second video has got bigger questions in it, including six marks, seven marks, 10 mark questions. Okay, we'll get started. So the first four questions we're gonna be covering. So for the first four questions, we're gonna be covering the operating system. So question one, memory management is one task performed by an operating system, but identify four other tasks performed by an operating system. So we're just identifying for four marks. And here we go, this is a function of our operating systems. There's all these different things. If I choose four different things out of here, I've got file management, which is organizing and managing files on the computer, like creating, deleting, and modifying files. The operating system um, is in charge of this. Process management, handling and executing multiple programs or process simultaneously, allocating resources and scheduling tasks. And we look at security and controlling the access to the system, who can log on to the system ensuring data privacy and protecting against unauthorized access. And finally, I've just mentioned here, error handling. Um, operating systems often include mechanisms for detecting and handling errors that um, occur during system operations. This could involve recovering from software crashes, managing hardware failure gracefully, or providing error messages to users when problems occur. So that's question one, that would give us four marks. If you just listed these, or listed any of these four things, you will pick up the marks there. Question two, identify the software used by the operating system to allow communication with many different devices. Okay, we're well, talking about hardware devices. So generally speaking, there's something called a, a device driver. These are generally little software packages that come with a hardware device that allow the operating system to communicate with various hardware devices like printers, keyboards, mice, and monitors. So usually everything runs in background. You don't need to, like you did back in the day, you don't need to actually install these, um, unless it's a really specific, unique piece of hardware. Three, explain why it would be not possible to use a computer without an operating system. Two marks, what explanation we're looking for. Using a computer without an operating system would be like having a car without a driver. Well, we have got driverless cars, but the operating system does act as a mediator between the hardware and the user. Managing resources, all these tasks here, running applications and providing a user interface. Without an operating system, the computer wouldn't know how to use its components or perform any tasks. Okay, and then the final question, question four, explain the role and position of the kernel in an operating system. This is three marks. So here's its role, here's its position. Basically, it's something that sits between, you've got CPU, memory and devices, and then the applications. Okay, so it sits in between here like this, but the kernel is the core component of the operating system. It manages the system's resources, such as the CPU, memory, and input and output devices. It also handles essential tasks like, like process scheduling, memory management, and hardware interaction. Its position, well, the kernel resides in the privileged mode of the operating system, which gives it direct access to the hardware. It operates on a lower level than other parts of the operating than other parts of the operating system, ensuring the critical system functions are handled efficiently and uh, securely. Okay, so that's three, five, six. That's, that's there. That would be the first ten marks. Okay, different types of operating systems. A washing machine uses an embedded operating system. Identify three other devices that would use an embedded operating system. So an operating system is basically built in to enable you to set the temperature, the speed, the timings, what you're loading into the machine, and all the different programs that you can sort of use and set up if you're putting specific items into a washing machine. So let's have a little look. Smartphones, okay, many smartphones use embedded operating systems to manage their functions efficiently and provide user-friendly interfaces. A smart TV, this again would have embedded operating systems. This again, embedded operating systems do power smart TVs, allowing them to run apps, stream content, and interact with other devices. Smart basically means it connects to the internet. So anything like Netflix, Amazon Prime, 
these are all part of your smart TV. It's basically the TV talking to the outside world. ATMs, automated teller machines, where you're getting money from, guy here. ATMs rely on embedded operating systems to handle transactions securely and manage user interactions effectively. Identify the type of operating system that air traffic control would need to use. Now, this is just for one mark. This would be a real, and this would get you the mark just writing this down, a real-time operating system, an RTOS, real-time operating system. Well, I'll tell you what it is. Basically, air traffic control systems require a real-time operating system to ensure that critical tasks are executed within strict time constraints. The RTOS guarantees timely processing of data and responses to ensure the safety and um, efficiency of air traffic management. Things have got to be done a split second, and that's why you would need a real-time operating system. But yeah, one mark, as I say, just for putting the title down, or even RTOS would get you one mark. And for two marks, give two benefits of a distributed operating system. What is a distributed operating system? Basically, it allows for scalability. A distributed operating system can distribute tasks across multiple machines, allowing it to handle a large number of users or processes efficiently. Okay. It also supports fault tolerance, which basically means distributing operating systems are designed to continue operating even if the individual components fail. By distributing tasks and data across multiple nodes, they can maintain system functionality even in the face of hardware failure or network issues. If something, if one machine goes down, they've still got the backup and they've still got the nodes, um, which they can, the um, tasks can be, can be bounced around. So again, two, five, another six marks um, for those. Okay, for three marks, explain what would happen if memory management wasn't carried out by the operating system. Okay, so let's have a little look at this. Well, the explanation basically if memory management wasn't performed by the operating system the computer would encounter several problems well firstly programs wouldn't be able to efficiently utilize the available memory leading to wastage or inefficient allocation additionally there would be a higher risk of conflicts between programs trying to access the same memory location simultaneously potentially causing crashes or data corruption and then without the proper memory management, the system would likely become unstable, unreliable, and prone to frequent errors or failures. It basically, it wouldn't work. It certainly wouldn't work properly. Okay, so that would give you three marks there. Uh, question nine, explain what paging and segmentation are and how an operating system would use, would make use of both of them. Paging and segmentation. Okay, well, I've got into quite a bit of detail here because it is worth four marks. So paging, if we use the analogy, imagine memory as a big book and page uh, and paging dividing the book into equal sized pages. OK, we split it into into different pages. Each page can hold a certain amount of information like a, a puzzle piece. The operating system keeps a, um, a special list called a, um, a page table to know where each page is in the book. This helps the computer find and use memory efficiently. OK, um, segmentation. Now think of memory as a large, um, as, a, as a big Lego set with different size pieces. Segmentation divides the sets into chunks or segments where each piece serves as a specific purpose, like one piece of building a house, another for a car. The operating system keeps another list called a segment table to keep track of these pieces. This makes it easy to find and use the right parts of memory for um, different tasks. It's basically indexing. Okay, so if we, if we talk about utilization, um, and how it's done by the operating system. By using both paging and segmentation, the computer can manage memory like a smart organizer. Paging helps keep everything neat and organized by dividing memory into equal parts, while segmentation adds flexibility by dividing it into pieces of different sizes. Together, they help the computer use memory efficiently, um, like putting together a big puzzle or a big or cool Lego creation, making everything run smoothly, okay? So I hope that makes sense. Question 10, describe for three marks, describe the role of the scheduler in an operating system. Well, what's a scheduler? It's a little bit like this guy here. Um, think of him like a, a, a traffic director, traffic controller of a busy intersection, okay, busy road. Um, its job is to decide which cars or tasks get to go next and for how long. In an operating system, the scheduler um, decides which programs or tasks get to use the computer's resources, like the CPU, and when it can use them. It makes sure everything's split second. 
it makes sure everything runs smoothly and fairly so no programs hog all the resources and keeping the system responsive and efficient okay that would get us three marks now bill for four marks this time bill is creating an android game and needs to test it on an android environment he doesn't have an android device though he doesn't have one to available for testing on explain how bill could test the device using his computer we need something called an emulator so let's have a little look at this bill can use something called an android emulator on his computer to test his game okay an emulator is like a virtual android device that runs on his computer he can download the software like android studio for example and uh, which uh, comes with an emulator or a third or other third party emulators then he installs the game on into the emulator just like he would on a real android device this way you can see how the game works test different features you can even test it on different devices different sort of samsung or, or google phones and make sure it runs smoothly all without needing an actual android device it's like having a pretend android phone right on your computer basically an emulator is used okay but that would get you four marks you sort of describe use maybe an analogy and go into some detail okay and chunk it into four different parts okay we move on to question 12 this is a couple of big questions here a couple of format questions so defragmentation is one example of utility software give four other examples of utility software i've started it here okay we've got um you can see here antivirus software and this is protecting your computer from viruses and malware we've got disk cleanup tools okay and this helps you free up space on your computer by deleting temporary files and unnecessary data maybe backup software allows you to make copies of your important files to prevent data loss okay and then maybe system maintenance tools and these help to optimize your computer's performance by cleaning up the registry which we'll come on to when we talk about defragmentation uh, managing startup programs and various other bits and bobs so there we go four different things there i suppose if you list give four other examples so one two three four okay Describe the operation of defragmentation. Here we go, four marks. So basically, this is, we've got two hard disks here. The one on the left is um, there's bits of data all over the place, scattered across the hard disk, the HDD. Whereas on this side, it's been defragged. Okay, defragmentation software has been used and it's been cl cleaned up, it's been tidied up. So I'm going to use the analogy of a messy room and scattered toys. Okay, so if you imagine if your hard disk is like this, where the files are like scattered toys, when you use your computer, these toys get moved around and stored in different places. You can see here, a bit more like my desk at a school. Defragmentation is like tidying up the room. It rearranges the toys so that they are all in one place, making it quicker and easier for you to find them when you want to play or yeah, you want to access the files. This helps your computer run faster and more smoothly. Okay. If you use an analogy, it does show that you it sort of it makes sense to you. You can sort of cross-reference it with something else. Question three, give or question fourteen in this case, give two benefits of open source software. Open source is basically it's free. Okay, it's free to use. Open source software is often available for free, saving you money on software costs. Okay, and monthly subscriptions or, or yearly annual bills. Uh, community support, because anyone can see and modify the source code. Of open source software open source software often benefits from a large community of developers who contribute to improving and fixing issues so if you're using open source software and you get stuck you might be able to get somebody um, some sort of free technical support or you might see in, in, a, in a community forum how to do certain tasks and certain things now we've got open source now we're going to have closed source for two marks give two drawbacks of closed source software well, let's have a little look okay um limited customization okay with closed source software you are often limited to how much you can modify or customize the software to suit your needs if you're buying sort of off-the-shelf software if you bought adobe photoshop um you wouldn't be um you wouldn't be expecting to sort of tweak it and make it do numerous different things it's designed to do a specific job which you're not meant to be tampering with okay um, dependent on the vendor since you can't access or modify the source code you're de dependent on the software's vendor for updates bug fixes and support which may not always be timely or satisfactory we're really talking about small programs here which you might be using okay 16 and 17 
I've got a lovely waterfall picture here, but we'll be talking about draw a diagram to represent the waterfall model. There's, there's a big waterfall, but it's not really what we're talking about, but it does cascade. And this, this is what we're talking about, sort of cascading. Okay, so if I transfer this to this, you can see I've sort of made it so it cascades down. And it's like, like an example here, like the waterfall. So it's broken down into five parts. Requirement analysis, um, what, what is the job that needs to be done? Design how we would solve the problem. Um, build the solution. Yeah, the actual coding and development of the software. Test it to meet to make sure it meets the requirements. And integration testing might be performed to verify that all components work together correctly. Then finally, once you've done all this, you've, you've analyzed it, you've designed it, you've created it, you've tested it to make sure it works. Then it's deployment. It's basically releasing it to the public, maybe as a beta test version to start with, but releasing the software. The software is deployed and made available to its users. Okay, so there's three marks. So basically, if you drew a sort of a sketch of this one, two, three, four, five things, you wouldn't need to describe it. If you, but if you could sort of get that in, in the right order, that would give you the three marks. Because here we've got the two benefits, and we can basically take any two of these. Give two benefits of the waterfall model. Okay, well, I've, I've made, uh, I've gone into quite, quite a bit of detail here. You don't need to go into this much for two marks. Again, you could just simply say um, simplicity brief explanation and clarity in requirements. So let's have a little look at this. Simplicity. The waterfall model is like following a recipe step by step. Well, it is yeah, cascading down. It's easy because you do one thing at a time. Yeah, just like making a sandwich where you put bread first, then you add the toppings. Um, this simplicity makes it easy for everyone to understand what needs to be done and when. Okay, and then clarity in, in requirements. Imagine you're planning a trip. And you know exactly where you want to go and what you want to do before you, and what you want to do before you start packing the waterfall model works um, similarly we decide what you need to do before you start working on the project okay analyzing the requirements designing the requirements the clarity helps everyone involved know exactly what's expected making it easy to plan and get things done without confusion a gantt chart works in a similar way where you sort of set a timing schedule for each of these components When's, when is the deadline? When does it need to be deployed? Okay, when do we need to finish the design stage? And that is the first 17 questions for video one. As I say, there will be a part two to this where we address the next um, 16, 17 questions. Okay, but thank you for watching. And I will see you next time. Please continue to ask questions, leave your comments, hit notifications, and please subscribe. And finally, if you wish to buy me a coffee, I'd be truly grateful. Please visit buymeacoffee.com forward slash learning zone. Thank you very much indeed. See you next time. Bye for now.